thanks for the invitation to speak to you today and um, uh, joining us. Uh, I always start my talks by acknowledging uh, the amazing people that I've gotten to work with over the years. Um, I've worked with uh, tremendous uh, students and collaborators, uh, fellow faculty, dive safety officers, uh, both in the U.S. and um, internationally. And, you know, it really is one of the reasons why I do what I do. Um, you know, it's uh, the, the ability to, to work with so many tremendous uh, individuals. Um, I also want to thank uh, funding agencies that have made all of this possible. Uh, and in particular, uh, I want to thank uh, my family, uh, my, my wife, Jeannie, my daughter, Naomi, and son, Nicholas, uh, because they've been doing this with me uh, as long as I've been doing it. Um, so uh, Jeannie's uh, been working with me since my first Marine uh, field trip and uh, my kids have basically been on almost every summer field season that, that I've had since. Um, I find this is an unusual time to be talking about science because, uh, or at least the kind of science I do, because, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, a nationwide uh, racial reckoning. Uh, there are wildfires burning. Uh, all over California and indeed all over the world. Um, and, you know, there's uh, an active war in, in Europe, which is kind of crazy. Um, and, you know, when you're trained as a scientist, people always, you know, they say, focus on the science, focus on the science, focus on the science. And, you know, I find it a little harder to just focus on the science now. And, and I think that perhaps maybe this emphasis on just focusing on the science is one of the reasons why perhaps there is so little trust of, of scientists and, and a lot of scientific research that is really essential for the functioning of our society. So I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Um, it's a talk in three acts. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about what I do, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do it. But more importantly, um, I'm going to talk about why I do this, um, and uh, we'll just jump right into it uh, with Act One: uh, Probabilities and Barriers. So, scientists work a lot in probabilities. So we say that the probability, you know, if, a, if you get a probability of less than 0 0.05, this is a significant result. And and what this really means is that you know, if your statistics suggest that the results that you observe would occur then less than 5% or one in 20 chance at random, that it must not be random and that something is, is going on. And um, I'm a Mexican American biologist, marine scientist, evolutionary geneticist, and in 1997, the year that I earned my PhD, only 3.4% of all biology PhDs in the United States were conferred to uh, people like me. Uh, when you extend this to marine science, it drops down to 0.37%. Um, but I would actually argue that the odds of me becoming a marine scientist uh, and being a professor at UCLA, we're, we're in fact almost zero. Uh, not quite zero because I am in fact here, um, but pretty close. And there are many reasons for this, none um, uh, including strong declarative statements uh, I made as a graduate student, such as I never want to be a faculty member at a research intensive university like Berkeley or UCLA. Uh, I actually said this to track quote in graduate school. Um, but the reasons why it's so unlikely that I'm a marine scientist are deeper than that. Uh, first, uh, as Armand said, uh, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. And for those of you who are not aware, uh, Tucson, Arizona is a desert. And uh, I don't have any 
precise statistics to quote, but I would argue that becoming a marine scientist coming from the desert is significantly less probable than becoming a marine scientist growing up uh, with uh, relatively easy access to the ocean. It's unlikely that I'm a marine scientist because I grew up in a low income household. Uh, in our house, uh, we used to raise rabbits. Um, uh, this is me as a, as a uh, young kid. Um, those rabbits are, are there, uh, not as pets, but to sell to the local butcher uh, so that we would have a little extra money to buy groceries. And coming from a low income household, you know, I grew up watching shows like, you know, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau and got to see him, you know, and his crew go all over the world and have all these amazing adventures. Uh, I watched shows like Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom host, hosted by Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler, who used to be the director of the San Diego Zoo. But these were all things that seemed completely inaccessible to me because, you know, I just didn't come from that kind of family that had those kinds of resources. It's also un uh, unlikely that I would ever become a marine scientist because I went to underserved, underperforming uh, minority majority schools. Uh, my middle school, Mansfeld Junior High School, uh, was the kind of school where you could be tapped on the shoulder in Mr. Peterson's American history class, turn around, and see a 45 caliber handgun pointed at your head. Uh, I can say this because this was the shoulder that was tapped. My high school was the kind of high school where less than 40% of uh, my class actually made it to graduation. We were, recruit we were visited not by college recruiters, but by military recruiters because so few of my classmates went on to college. It's also incredibly unlikely that I was um, would become a marine scientist because although I had an innate interest in, in fish and marine biology um, and, and in particular fishing, um, I didn't know anything as an undergraduate about science careers in science and doing research and what uh, you know professors at a university actually do. Um, I was actually, uh, more interested at the time in music and potentially having a career as a musician. And I had no idea that while I was spending 15 to 20 hours a week in the practice room developing my skills as a percussionist, that other students were doing the same thing, but in research labs all across campus, preparing for careers in science. And it was only through serendipity that the second semester of my junior year at the University of Arizona, I took a class, an animal behavior class by Dr. Marilyn Houck and a herpetology class from uh, Chuck Lowe. And both of these classes required that I do some sort of small research project as a student in the class. And so I decided to be efficient. Um, I would study the behavior of the canyon tree frog. Um, specifically, what I was interested in is this tree frog, as you can see, looks very much like a piece of granite, um, but looking like a piece of granite doesn't help you if you're not on a piece of granite. And so I was interested in, in understanding how it knows that it's on a piece of granite. Um, I don't remember what my experiment showed, but what I do remember is both Marilyn and Chuck telling me you should go to graduate school and you should go to Berkeley. And so I did, I went to Berkeley to do my PhD, although I, I, I'm still at a loss to explain why I did it other than uh, it was a way to get out of Tucson, Arizona. And I went to Berkeley to work with Dr. Uh, Anthony Bernoski, and I went there to study the canyon tree frog. And what I was interested in is that these frogs, they live in the desert. And they live in these tiny little pockets of aquatic habitat surrounded by a sea of desert. And when I say they're surrounded by a sea of desert, I want to show you what this, what this means. This little pool of water here exists in a canyon 
in the uh, Catalina mountain range north of Tucson. Here is a satellite view of southern Arizona, and each of these dark green areas are these uh, mountain ranges referred to as sky islands. They're called sky islands because if you look at them from the desert floor, they're these, it's, it's like an island rising out of uh, the ocean, except it's a sea of, of desert. And so what I was interested in is if these frogs live in these tiny little pockets of aquatic habitat surrounded by a sea of desert, how do you get all the frogs where they are? And I spent two years trying to develop the genetic methods to answer that question, and I failed. And so uh, after two years of beating my head against a wall, I decided, you know what, I'm going to change gears and I'm going to study banded mongooses. Uh, I was interested in these because they have a lot of unusual behaviors that suggest that they are more closely related than uh, that these family groups are more closely related to each other than you would think um, otherwise. That that maybe they're actually like a social insect where sibs are more than 50% uh, related to each other. And in the process of trying to develop this project, uh, I got offered the opportunity to study maternal behavior in spotted hyenas. And I'd grown up watching this really cool show, Wild Kingdom, where they're always going to Africa, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. And so uh, I switched gears and decided I was going to do my PhD on uh, maternal behavior and spotted hyenas. Uh, I lived in a tent in the middle of the Maasai Mara game reserve. Uh, it's a good gig if you can get it. It's kind of lonely, but it's really amazing. Uh, I spent time uh, darting and radio collaring hyenas and tracking them. And this project turned out to be a complete disaster. Um, so much so that I had to leave after a year and change gears again. And so in my fourth year of graduate school, um, with uh, fellow graduate students, Chris Myers and Alan Collins, we wrote a grant to try to use genetics as a way to track larval dispersal in marine environments. Um, most marine organisms have a larval phase that enters into the water column where they disperse on ocean currents for anywhere between hours to months. And we were gonna do a project focused on clownfish, cowries, and sponges, and this didn't get funded. And so yet again, I had failed. At that point, I entered my fifth year and my PhD advisor, Tony, decided he was leaving for another institution. Being a PhD student in your fifth year without a project and without an advisor is a bad place to be. But a new faculty member, Tyrone Hayes, uh, joined the faculty at UCLA and offered me a position in his lab. And in the two years that had passed since I gave up on my frog project, technologies caught up with my idea. And I was able to go out and collect and sequence the DNA of frogs from populations all around Southern Arizona. And these different colors indicate evolutionarily distinct lineages of frogs. And they occur in clusters. And the cool thing is that these clusters exist in the way that they do because those populations occur along very specific watersheds. And the reason that these frog populations are where they are is that during the Pleistocene, during the last ice age, the desert Southwest was not a desert. It was much wetter and it was much cooler. And these frogs dispersed on these rivers that are now mostly dry, but used to flow uh, continuously during uh, the ice ages. So this brings us to 1997. And 1997 was in a a very important year for me for many reasons. 
Uh, first and foremost, uh, I was uh, introduced uh, by my friend Mark Erdman there in the middle uh, to Jeannie Choi uh, on your right there, who uh, I would end up marrying uh, two years later, or sorry, three years later. Um, I met her in, in September of 1997, so 25 years ago. But the other reason why 1997 was important is that uh, my friend Mark, who is a marine scientist, he introduced me to this area called the Coral Triangle. The Coral Triangle is a region of Southeast Asia comprised of the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. And it's the largest and most biologically diverse marine ecosystem on the planet. Mark got me, uh, brought me to uh, the Coral Triangle for the first time uh, for his wedding. That's actually where I met my wife. Um, and uh, he also at the same time introduced me to these organisms here called mantis shrimps. And in 1997, he and I started this little project together looking at the genetics of mantis shrimps. And we were looking at different populations across the coral triangle. And we found that there was one group of populations that had a particular genetic type. And there was another group of populations that had another genetic type. Now, this isn't particularly unusual. There's genetic variation in lots of populations, but like most marine organisms, mantis shrimp have this dispersive larval period. This is a, a larval mantis shrimp. What made our data so surprising was where these populations were. And Two of these populations were in the southern part of Indonesia, uh, off of Bali and the island of Java. Those were one genetic type. The other genetic type was on the northern shores of Sulawesi. Now, these colors that you see moving behind this map are models of water flow through the Indonesian archipelago. 20 million cubic meters of water per second are moving from the Pacific Ocean here into the Indian Ocean here through the Indonesian archipelago. And there are very strong currents in this region here called the Makassar Strait. Those currents can be as strong as a meter per second. And because these stomatopods have this larval dispersal period, we should not be observing genetic differences here. That was super, super surprising. The other reason why 1997 was such an important year for me and my career was that in November uh, 1997, uh, about uh, two months after I first met my wife, um, Callum Roberts published a paper in Science, the uh, preeminent uh, science journal in the United States. And in this, he posed this idea that if we knew the physical oceanography of a region like the Caribbean here, and we knew the direction that the water flowed as represented by this arrow, and we knew how long a fish larvae might spend in the water column, we can predict how far those larvae would travel. And you know, if the fish is in the water column for a month, it'll travel a certain distance. If it travels in the water column for two months, it may travel much, much longer, both because of the length of time as well as the strength of currents that it experiences during that two month period. And Colin proposed this idea as a way to decide where to where to site marine protected areas so that they had sufficient ecological connectivity among, there's a sufficient larval exchange amongst the populations to be sustainable. And the really cool thing is that I had a data set that showed that this idea was wrong. Um, and it's not very often that you see a publication 
in a really high profile journal that you can immediately say, I know that's not true. I have data that shows that's not true. And I was able to use that preliminary data to get an NSF postdoctoral fellowship, which I uh, took at Harvard University. I expanded on our initial studies of these mantis shrimp and showed that this white uh, genotype occurred all throughout Southern Indonesia, but it did not occur north of the, the Java and Flores seas. And we were interested in why this happened. And what we, uh, what we did is we looked at this pattern in a number of different organisms, a number of different stomatopods, and they all had very similar patterns. And when you have similar genetic patterns in multiple species that are distributed over the same area, it has to be driven by a shared process. And the shared process that is driving this pattern is Pleistocene sea level changes. So as those glaciers rose up on land that created those cooler, wetter climates that allowed my frogs to disperse in those river systems of Southern Arizona, all of that ice that built up in those glaciers in North America came out of the ocean and sea levels dropped by 120 meters. In this area that we now think of as ocean with some islands is mainly land with some very, very narrow ocean passages. And so this is what is driving this differentiation between these populations on the Pacific side of Indonesia and populations on the Indian Ocean side of Indonesia. We then expanded our sampling into a region called Telek Chendrawasi, the bird of paradise bay. And we found a third very different genetic lineage. And this was really confusing to us because it's hard to cut something in half as you would see with lowered sea levels and end up with three pieces. And this is the point of the talk where I have to make uh, a confession, which is I have no formal training in marine science at all. Never, not once, not even one class. Um, but had I had some formal marine science training, I would have learned about the Western boundary currents of the Pacific. Here's this animation that I showed you before. And what I want you to focus on is this mass of spinning water here off the uh, island of Halmahera. This is called the Halmahera Eddy. And the Halmahera Eddy takes water that originates on the northern shores of the island of Papua and turns those back around so that they um, go back to the east on the North Equatorial Pacific countercurrent. And because the waters from this part of Southeast Asia, do not cross this particular part of Indonesia, the Maluku Sea, well, what's in that water? It's a bunch of larvae from a bunch of marine organisms, including my stomatopods. So had I actually known anything about marine science, I would have predicted beforehand that I would have seen genetic differentiation across this region. So these studies as a postdoctoral fellow uh, helped me land my first faculty position at Boston University in their marine program in Woods Hole. And, um, you know, I did, I started developing a research program focused on understanding the origins of the Coral Triangle Biodiversity Hotspot. I wanted to know why this part of the ocean were the world's most biodiverse marine ecosystems. And there were two standing hypotheses. One was that it was a center of accumulation and that speciation occurred in the isolated islands of the Pacific and Indian Oceans 
and that over time that diversity accumulates in the coral triangle. Now, there is another hypothesis called the center of origin hypothesis that suggested that the diversity is evolving inside of the coral triangle and that that biodiversity is then exported to the peripheral islands of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Sorry, wrong button. So as I mentioned before, um, most marine organisms have this larval dispersal phase. And um, so we could look at a lot of different organisms and try to understand this pattern of biodiversity and understand why biodiversity peaks in this little part of Southeast Asia. And specifically what we wanted to test was whether these processes that we've seen that have driven diversification in these mantis shrimp, do they occur in other species? And so I was writing, I wrote this grant um, to look at a lot of different species from wrasses like the checkerboard wrasse to giant clams to uh, the blue sea star, uh, clownfish, snails, large pelagic things like Spanish mackerel. And I wanted to see do all of them have the same sort of patterns as we see in mantis shrimp? But as I was doing this, it was hard for me not to think about how crazy it was that a Mexican American kid who grew up in the desert, went to crappy schools and studied frogs, somehow is a marine scientist. Um, and the unlikelihood of that happening um, to me was just staggering. And I realized, you know, as I went to marine conferences that there were not very many uh, black people in the room. There were not very many, uh, you know, Chicanos in the room. And, you know, I decided that my path can't be the model because the probability of that happening again is just too small. And so I decided I would create a program called the Diversity Project. Um, and the focus of the Diversity Project is to increase diversity in marine science through doing research on marine biodiversity. And so uh, you know, we developed this program where we would uh, bring students to the field from all over the country. Uh, we would, they would help us uh, collect uh, the samples that we needed for our study. Uh, we would train them in the lab. They would collect the data that we needed for our study. And through the diversity project and using this as a training platform to diversify science, we were able to show that yes, indeed, these patterns that we saw in mantis shrimp are actually repeated in a lot of other species. And we can sort of summarize this data as follows. East, sorry, Western and Southern Indonesia have genetically distinct populations. These are very distinct from populations in Central Indonesia and the Philippines. Those in turn are very different from those in Eastern Indonesia. And within Eastern Indonesia, Telek Chandrawasi is also almost always genetically distinct. And this is because uh, although this is an open bay now, uh, if you go back to uh, the Pleistocene uh, and the Pliocene during low sea level stands, uh, this bay is almost completely enclosed uh, by land masses, creating isolation within that bay. And so basically, with this first grant uh, that I wrote uh, and the data that we collected, we were able to uh, show that it, indeed um, the coral triangle is a center of origin 
and it is evolving within this biodiversity hotspot and that biodiversity is exported to other areas of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. So barriers in this case were very important to evolution of marine biodiversity. Act two, beyond barriers. Over the years, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of really talented people. Two of the most talented have been Jonathan Kuhl and Eric Tremel. Uh, these are biologists that are also computer scientists, and they create these really cool biophysical connectivity models. And what does that mean? What does it mean? What it means is that they can create a virtual ocean with virtual currents and drop virtual larvae into these virtual oceans with real biological parameters. And they can run their models over and over. And the red colors here indicate high probability of larvae making it from one population to another. The blue, the greens and blues mean low probability. And what they can do is that they can run this model for thousands, tens of thousands of years, and then they can integrate those results. And they can do it for multiple species, uh, like giant clams, uh, the uh, domino damselfish, and the convict surgeon. And summarize these results as a heat map, where red, again, indicates regions of high larval exchange, the greens and blues indicate low larval exchange. And what I'd like to highlight here is that Western Indonesia is separate from Central Indonesia and the Philippines, which is separate from Eastern Indonesia. And within Eastern Indonesia, Telek Chandrawasi is also different. And so even if you just look at ocean currents, those ocean currents are, uh, creating dispersal pathways that are either driving or perhaps reinforcing these differences uh, that we see uh, coming from uh, large scale currents like the Halmahera Eddy or the isolation that occurred during uh, Pleistocene low sea level stance. But we've taken our explorations uh, of origins of marine biodiversity in Indonesia even further. Uh, two of my amazing graduate students, uh, former graduate students, they're Dr. Simmons and Dr. Fritz Pinneman now. Um, they uh, were interested in a group of organisms that are corallivores. Uh, so uh, Sarah studied uh, uh, Coriolophila uh, violaceae, uh, Allison studied Festilla minor. And what's interesting about these particular organisms is that they love corals. They spend their entire life on coral with the exception of that larval dispersal phase. Um, you know, from the time they settle from the larval uh, stage to the time that they die, they will live on a single coral head. Now, they don't just love corals, they love to eat corals. And they spend their entire life feeding on that specific coral head that they landed on. And originally, when they started working on these groups, they wanted to, you know, they were hoping that they would show these same patterns that we saw in other marine species but what they found was that these genetic, these genetically different regions that we see in clownfish and giant clams and stomatopods and wrasses in large pelagic fishes, they don't exist for these snails or nudibranchs. And we were really puzzled by that because when we looked at these when we looked at their samples, there was strong genetic differentiation there. It just had no geographic pattern. 
And we were really stumped at this. Fortunately, every time they sampled a snail or a nudibranch, they took a small sample of the coral. And they took note of what species of coral it was on. And these two taxa uh, spend a lot of time. Uh, one of the most common corals that they uh, colonize are from the genus Parides. And I know this is a complicated figure, but what I want you to notice here is that there are two groups. And these two groups are confirmed through genetics that there is a group of parietes that are all related to parietes lobata. That's one species. Um, there is another genetic group related to the species parietes cylindrica. So that's all I want you to take away from this figure. When you plot the genetics of the coral host onto the patterns of genetic differentiation that you see within the snails or the nudibranchs, what you see is that the snails, uh, what we show here, there is a group that um, lives on the corals in the Parides lobata clade. And there's another group that lives on the corals from the Parides cylindrica clade. And you see this whether you look at DNA sequence data from mitochondrial DNA or whether you do genome surveys of genetic variation across the entirety of the genome of these organisms. And so what this is saying is that the geographic barriers that drive differentiation in mantis shrimp mean nothing to these particular snails. What is impacting these snails is the coral host that they live on. And that if a snail lives on Parides lobata, it will never meet and mate with a snail that lives on a Parides cylindrica. And because they will never meet and they will never mate, there will never be any genetic exchange. And their ancestors will repeat this process for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, resulting in the types of genetic variation that we see in our data. And so in this case, it's not geographic barriers, but ecological differences that is leading to uh, lineage diversification and potentially ultimately speciation in this particular group. Act three, beyond barriers. If you look at the diversity of the STEM workforce in the US, it is much less diverse than our demographics. In the US, 33% of uh, our population are uh, Black, Latinx, uh, Pacific Islanders, Native Alaskans, Native Americans. Uh, that is three times higher than what we see in the STEM workforce. And uh, one of the reasons why we see this is that if you look at STEM, de STEM degree completion in uh, STEM majors in colleges and universities across the US, what you see is that Latinx and Black students complete STEM degrees at a rate that is far less than their uh, white and Asian peers. This is true at UCLA. Uh, UCLA, white and Asian students have a 70% probability of finishing a STEM degree uh, as opposed to just under 40% for uh, underrepresented, underrepresented minoritized populations. Now, Working in higher education, uh, when people are confronted with this data, what I see and hear all the time is what I like to call the blame game. 
let's blame the K through 12 system for this persistence gap, this difference between the success of white and Asian and underrepresented minoritized populations. And what my colleagues say is, you know what? They need to fix the K through 12 system. You know, it, it's, it's really a problem of what's happening in the public K through 12 system. You know, there's, there's nothing that I can do. I can only teach the students that come into my classrooms. And if they're underprepared and not prepared to succeed, there's nothing that I can do. And I hear this all the time. At UCLA, I direct a program called PEERS, the Program for Excellence in Education and Research in the Sciences. That's a mouthful. That's why we call it PEERS. Uh, PEERS serves uh, students that a lot of people would say are at risk. Uh, you know, it's mostly underrepresented, minoritized uh, populations. Uh, most of them are the first in their family to go to college. Uh, most of them come from uh, low economic status uh, backgrounds. Most of them come from low performing high schools. And um, what we do in peers is that it is a cohort based model where we have 200 students per cohort. It serves first and second year STEM majors at UCLA. We uh, provide seminars focused on, on academic survival skills and career development. We have dedicated academic counselors uh, that can personalize their advising to our students. Uh, we have collaborative learning workshops that uh, support the core science classes that our students take as first and second year science students. And then there are research talks that we uh, have our students uh, participate in uh, twice a quarter, so six times a year. Now, what I'd like to point out in terms of what peers is, is also what it is not. It is not remedial. There is not a remedial anything in our program. Uh, our view is that Regardless of the background that these students come from, the fact that they made it to UCLA, the school that gets more applications for admission than any university on the planet, the fact that they made it here means that they are incredibly talented people. We don't need to do remedial work with them. What we need to do is support their success and one through six does that. Um, Peers isn't just an academic support program, it's also a controlled study. And um, what I'm showing you here is just, you know, data from uh, a couple of peer co peers cohorts from when the, the cohort size was smaller, uh, comparison to the control groups. There's no differences in gender um, uh, ratios in high school GPA, in SAT scores, math SAT scores, um, you know, in the percentage of uh, minority versus uh, majority students, no significant difference whatsoever. However, when you compare the success of peer students in their introductory life science courses, peer students do significantly better than the control group. If you look at math, courses, they do significantly better. If you look at chemistry courses, they do significantly better. And because they're doing significantly better in their individual courses, they have significantly higher GPAs at the end of their second year. And so because the students are doing well, um, the students stay in STEM majors. So uh, here is the uh, percent STEM degree completion uh, of peer students compared to the control group. Peer students complete their STEM degrees at a significantly higher rate than the control, but it is not significantly different from white and Asian students, even though it's actually higher. So in peers, you know, our students, um, one of the uh, important things about our students is that they are twice as likely to do undergraduate research than the control group as well. They are six times more likely to get scholarships for doing research 
They're twice as likely to go to med school and they are seven times more likely to go on to grad school into PhD programs. And so what this data shows is that regardless of the challenges of the K through 12 system, and I'm not going to defend our K through 12 system whatsoever, I think it's atrocious. I think it's shameful. Um, I think we are a global embarrassment in terms of our education of STEM students in the United States. However, these challenges do not have to be barriers to success. Despite our students being considered at risk because of all of these factors that are associated with low STEM degree completion, they are the single most successful group of STEM majors at UCLA full stop. And it's just how we decide to view these students. We can view them as future successful STEM majors, or we can view them as students who are unlikely to succeed. And that makes all the difference. So peers is focused on STEM in general. Um, I already showed you this horrific statistic. If you extend this to marine science, it's even worse. Uh, so um, this is a function of uh, historical exclusion, uh, Jim Crow era laws uh, that prohibited uh, blacks and other people of color from uh, using uh, public swimming pools, uh, from using public swimming beaches, uh, you know, here is uh, a, a, a crowd of black swimmers in Florida being beaten by police in Florida, go figure, um, because they uh, were on a beach. And this is, has had longstanding impacts on this community where they're less likely to engage in swimming activities and other water sports. And so, um, I talked to you uh, a little bit earlier about how we collected the data uh, to examine origins of marine biodiversity in the Coral Triangle. We did it through the Diversity Project. Um, but I want to talk to you now a little bit about the Diversity Project because um, it was designed to be a transformative international research experience focusing on diversifying marine science. We accept students into our program that don't even know how to swim. Um, we train them to be scuba divers, to be uh, to use scuba as a research tool. They do have to learn how to swim along the way. Um, and then we take them out to places like Indonesia or French Polynesia, where we teach them to use these scuba skills as a research tool. And they use this research tool to understand the origins of marine biodiversity. They look at uh, ecological processes on uh, coral reef ecosystems, particularly ones related to marine conservation. Uh, they do uh, uh, some diving out in the kelp forests of uh, Southern California as well. We take them to the aquariums. Uh, where they, they they dive in the aquarium of the California Science Center. Um, you know, and you know, they they learn things in the lab as well. And to date, we've had almost a hundred alumni, uh, mostly black and Latinx, mostly women. Um, and the program's having an impact. So to date, uh, more than 70% of our students have matriculated to graduate school. Uh, forgot to update this. This is now uh, 18 of our alumni have uh, completed their PhDs. Uh, some of them, those were just recently, including one of my students last week. Um, 22 are currently enrolled in PhD programs. Three have received Fulbright fellowships. 13 have been funded by the National Science Foundation to go on to their PhD programs. Uh, 11 have been funded by the UC HBCU Fellowship Program. We've got three uh, former students who are uh, tenure track faculty. There are two uh, alumni who are uh, board members of the Association for the Study of Limnology and Oceanography. And as much as I love these stats, what I want to show you is just 
some pictures of who these people are and you know they've been at Harvard and Santa Cruz and Stanford and UCLA um, University of Alaska Scripps Institute of Oceanography UC Davis and some things that have always made the diversity project unique um, and, and have been consistent over the you know 18 years we've done this is it's always been international we always work in really amazing exciting places um it's always been field based and it's always been a family endeavor so my family has been on uh almost uh well have has been involved in every single year that i've run this um, so too with my collaborator, uh, Peggy Fong, her daughter, Caitlin, there on the right, uh, have been working with us for almost the last 10 years. Um, and we've always set up this program to be really fun. And uh, you know, we want to make this an experience where when students finish, they immediately want to figure out, how do I keep doing this? Um, but one really uh, formative thing happened in 2013, which is after almost 16 years of getting research permits in Indonesia, suddenly I was denied research permit. Um, this happened a week before we were supposed to go to Indonesia to do our program. And so I was panicking, but my collaborator, Peggy and Caitlin said, no, no, we know what to do. Um, let's take the program to Morea. Uh, Peggy and Caitlin have been working out Morea in French Polynesia for a while. And um, what we noticed once we went to Morea was that um, we had dramatic shifts in outcomes. So if we look at the desire to pursue a, a career in marine science, pre uh, when we were in, in Indonesia in blue and French Polynesia in red, it almost doubles. If we look at the desire to pursue graduate school, you know, only 55% of our students had that ambition before, now all of them do. If you look at how many people enroll in PhD programs or uh, intend to enroll in PhD programs, again, it almost doubles. And so what I wanted to know is, you know, what actually makes the difference? And, and this is something that we're studying right now, but we have some hypotheses. One is, is that um, one of the things that has become a consistent part of our program is scientific diving training. We didn't do this initially in Indonesia. And I think providing this dive training really makes a difference for the students. But I think the other thing that really makes a difference is that we would bring back alumni to serve as peer mentors, like Camille and Tierra, uh, both of which have completed their PhDs and are doing amazing things now. Um, having those peer mentors has been really impactful. But one of the other things that I think really makes a difference is that um, we've increased the size of the program uh, as we've shifted to Morea. And with more students in the program, there's a bigger sense of belonging. There's a stronger sense of community. And not only is there a stronger sense of community, there's a stronger sense of family because at the end of each summer, we actually bring family members, one family member of each student to UCLA so that they can hear about the research that their son or daughter did, and they can see them diving in this giant kelp exhibit at the California Science Center. Um, and um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, this, this uh, particular uh, slide here. Um, but what I'd like you to just listen to here. On top of being able to conduct our own projects in a different country, we got to learn about graduate school and look at their uh, universities, look around, talk to the mentors and the graduate students. 
we definitely talked to the graduate students and it really helped me when it came to um, thinking about graduate school and where I wanted to go. I'm definitely more confident in just conducting research and diving and swimming. Learn how to scientifically scuba dive. That was really helpful in our projects. I learned how to work well with others. In the field of marine science, it's not a lot of black men. This experience, I need to go back into my university to tell them. I met so many different people. I met a whole bunch of different professors. I'm gonna start crying. Okay. No, it was just really um, amazing. Basically, the diversity project pushed me, like, and it showed me that I, I'm capable of going off to graduate school. I felt like this whole summer we got to see the entire life cycle of what it's like from like designing a project to being out in the field to coming back and analyzing to presenting it. And so the best part was just finally understanding what that lifestyle is like. So not only knowing what it's like to go out and collect the data, but also what it's like to have a dinner party with other scientists and learn about their research and to be able to step back and really evaluate, is this something that I could see myself doing? And I think actually most of us really found that it was something that we were passionate about and we could see ourselves doing this every day for a long time. Usually you're working under other people with what the projects that they're doing. And the difference here in the, the diversity project is that you actually have the freedom to, to do what you want. Before the program started, like the days were getting closer, I was like, Oh my God, like, this is really cool, but I'm kind of getting scared because I don't know what to ask. I could say that I feel different now that we came back. I, I feel like empowered. I feel like I could state a question and actually go through it and feel like my brain was open. Like, like you could do this. Like, why are you always putting this thoughts of, no, nah, you're not good enough or you, you can't do it. And it was shown through me to the program that I'm able to do what I want to do. I'm like, oh, I'm ready to just continue and, and, uh, and learn new things. Just having the support system and being able to know that, you know, you can do it, you can get through it, you can do the research, and knowing that there are all these people really cheering you on. It challenged me to do new things or do things that I didn't think that I could before. Like I'd say throughout the program, you definitely accumulate more confidence in yourself. They guided us along the way, but it was really good for someone to have the confidence in you to pull all that off. And now we have the opportunity to get our work published. I learned a lot about myself and about science. It was a good experience. Epilogue. Lessons learned. Um, Some of the things that I want to take you to take away from this um, beyond just, you know, the science and you know, uh, origins of marine biodiversity and larval dispersal and currents and whatnot. Um, I think there's, there's deeper lessons here. Um, the first is that words have power and um, you know, I told you about Marilyn and Chuck saying you should go to graduate school and you should go to Berkeley. What I didn't tell you at the time is that I had the opportunity to talk with Marilyn later in my career and told her how formative those words were to me and putting me on the path that I was on. She had no recollection of saying them. And how many times do we have interactions with people and we don't think about the power that our words can have uh, either for uh, you know, good or for bad. And I think all of us would be benefit from thinking more about the power of, of our words and thinking about how to harness those in ways that are productive. I think it's important that we advocate for others. Um, I told you about joining the lab of uh, my second PhD advisor, Tyrone Hayes. What I didn't tell you about Tyrone is that uh, Tyrone and I were actually graduate students together. And um, one of the only reasons that I actually got into Berkeley is that Tyrone happened to be the graduate student representative on the admissions committee the year that I applied. And I wasn't gonna get into graduate school at Berkeley. 
but he insisted and he advocated for me. And, um, you know, without him doing that, we would not be having this conversation today. I think it's important to be willing to take a chance on people. Um, I told you about my uh, first PhD advisor, Tony Bernoski. What I didn't tell you is that Tony is actually a paleontologist and that, you know, I was, you know, when I applied to graduate school, I was very clear that I was interested in genetics. And even though we had a very different interest in scientific discipline, he saw the potential and he gave me a chance. And um, had he not decided to bring me to Berkeley, again, I, I don't know that we would be having this conversation right now. The other lesson that I think um, is really important is that we need to be more intentional in creating opportunities for those who haven't always had them. Um, there are so many times where we, we look at our workplaces and we say, you know, yes, there's lots of diversity, but, but what is there that I can do about it? And, and the answer is you can do a lot. You know, you just have to decide to actually do it. And if you do it, it can be incredibly impactful um, and not only is it impactful in terms of, of uh, you know, the outcomes of these students, it, it's actually the favorite part of my job. Um, I live for this summer program. Um, and if I couldn't do this summer program, I don't know if I'd continue being a faculty member. And so in summary, I think it's really important that we start thinking beyond barriers. Too often we think about why we can't do something instead of thinking about why we can. And, you know, in order to think beyond these barriers, the first step is to believe that it's possible. And once we believe it's possible, that's when we can finally enact change. Thank you. All right, I think we're ready to start questions, yeah? I think we already have some, it looks like, but everyone, uh, if you guys would like to ask questions, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom, um, and we will just, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the first one here says, uh, what role do you see of junior or community colleges in bringing a greater diversity in science and research? Yeah, so um, that's, a very, that's a very good question. And um, actually a very timely one because this last year, uh, one of the people that we brought out to work with us was actually a, a community college professor. Um, we've had students who uh, have started their educational careers at community colleges, but we've never recruited a student directly from community colleges. Um, although my, I, I work with my postdoc on a program that, that does that. Um, but uh, yeah, based on the, this last summer and how amazing uh, uh, Kimo Morris was, uh, the, the faculty member who came out with us, um, we, we actually are, are now talking about writing a grant specifically to expand this in a way that we can bring in community college students. Um, you know, we have been working a lot with HBCUs over the years, and, um, you know, it's been really impactful uh, bringing together students from places like Stanford and Yale and you know UCLA and Berkeley and having them you know work side by side and and spend 10 weeks living with students from HBCUs because they're they're very different educational experiences and I, I think um it's one that is is mutually beneficial for both parties to to really understand that we have these very different educational systems uh in our country 
uh, each with their own unique advantages and each with their own unique disadvantages. And um, that by bringing them together, you know, you can really, uh, you know, develop some, some really powerful synergies. That's amazing. Um, I, yeah, I was really, I was really uh, happy to hear all about the different stuff that you are doing to help, you know, provide for all the um, diversity that can happen in, in these sorts of programs. We actually have a question here uh, from John. It says, I'm super excited to learn about your diversity program, but I live in Minnesota. Are you willing to talk to faculty and administrators at other educational institutions uh, about setting up a similar program in their biology departments? So I, I'm, I'm happy to talk with anyone and any anyone who like anywhere uh, yeah. about doing this. Um, and um you know what we're we're actually doing research now on what makes the diversity project work um uh you know it's it's kind of funny nsf has been uh running this program called the research experience for undergraduate program for decades and you know literally tens of thousands of students have gone through these summer training and mentoring programs in labs all across the country. And they actually have no data on student success. And so we don't have any data that we can compare ours to, but I know that it's a fraction of the success that our program has in terms of students going on to graduate school. And I, I can say that um, because um, I talk with other people who run programs and they collect that data on their programs. And they're like, wait, like, how do you have like a group of like all people of color and, you know, you have these like 70% of your students are going on to graduate school. That's crazy. Um, you know, most people don't even understand like, wait, how can you how can you actually recruit that many students of color into your program? Um, the answer to that is like you show up and mm -hmm. you actually try as opposed to sending out an email saying, you know, here's my program and hope that they find you. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to talk with anyone, but, uh, you know. We also, it's important to note, our students come from all over the country. So this last year, we had students from UC Santa Cruz, UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego, uh, Hampton University, uh, University of DC, Oakwood University, University of Missouri, um i'm missing some university of maryland and morehouse college uh, hmm. so you know from all over the country uh and and that's actually that's the that's not the exception that's that's just a normal summer that's that's fantastic um, a couple more questions here. One says, thank you, Dr. Barber, for sharing your inspiring journey and work. What is one piece of advice you would give students at different stages of their training, whether it's high school, undergraduate or graduate, who one day to hope pursue hope to pursue a career in research and or academia? Uh, don't give up. There, there is I, I tell this to students all the time. The 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 one and only person that will prevent you from succeeding in science is you um and um you know if you give up you're not going to succeed if you don't give up it will happen and um you know uh early on uh when my like my wife and i started dating uh just as i was just as i had finished my phd and, you know, she would introduce me to people and it was like, oh, you know, yeah, he just finished his PhD at Berkeley. And they're like, wow, you must be really smart. And my immediate answer was, no, I'm really stubborn. Um, you know, if I was really smart, like, you know, I wouldn't have had to gone to college. I'd have been Bill Gates or, you know, one of these other, you know, tech people that, you know, uh, you know, the 
the Silicon Valley garage, you know, I would have had one of those. I'd have been Steve Jobs. You know, I wouldn't have had to gone to college. I would have like, you know, I, I, I'd be making lots of money, you know, you know, without ever having to gone to college, you know, the, mm -hmm. the difference between me and, and, and people who don't finish a PhD is that, you know, if I have one personality trait is like, I am stubborn as hell. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, when we had our, our kids, you know, and I like sitting here battling with the two-year-old telling my two-year-old daughter, it's just like, listen, you are not going to beat me in a stubborn contest. I can promise you that. So, um, yeah, just, just don't give up and seek out opportunities. Um, uh, if you don't like the advice that people are giving you, find people who give you different advice. Um, my first departmental chair told me that the diversity project was a waste of time and that I should just focus my time exclusively on doing research and not waste my time doing something that's, you know, uh, focused on education and, um, uh, he, he just, he just couldn't have been more wrong. So don't give up, seek out opportunities and, and find, find mentors who will, who give you advice that, that makes sense with your values. Yeah, that's, that's definitely some great advice. I think both in life and career, uh, anything that can definitely apply. Um, yeah. Another question here, it says, in the context of your lab, what are some ways that you work to facilitate a supportive environment for your trainees? Um, you know, it, it's, I think one thing that, that helps a lot is that like we've always done field work with together and, you know, it, it's, there's a very different kind of environment when you're living and working with students than, you know, when you're only just in the lab. Um, and, uh, you know, like, you know, maybe you go see a baseball game together. Maybe you go out to dinner every so often or something like that. Um, you know, and other than that, it's all about like lab meetings and, you know, what are your results? What are your data? you know, present your work next week sort of thing. Um, I, I think that that the field component really helps, particularly the international field component, um, you know, is from day one, when I started taking students to Indonesia, you know, one of the first things I would do is I would take them to a, a restaurant there, uh, well, a type of restaurant, there's a, a kind of Indonesian food called Padang, which is, uh, uh, comes from Sumatra. And um, uh, it's changed now a little bit, but traditionally, like when you went to a Padang restaurant, there were no utensils at all. No forks, no spoons, no chopsticks, no, no anything. And you always ate it with your, you just eat it with your hands. And that's, that's how you eat at a Padang restaurant. And um, that'd be one of the first things I would do, like take them to a Padang restaurant. And it's just like, you know, this is, this is Indonesia. And, you know, like we, you know, I would take them surfing, um, teach them how to surf. Uh, you know, we would go, you know, do things that were, like, were fun and interesting. And um, I, I think when you do that, you know, you develop these relationships that are much more personal um, I, I, you know, I would say that, you know, I view all of my students as a member of my family. And I would think, I would say that if you ask almost all of my students, you know, like, do they view themselves if, as a member of my family? They would say, yes, you know, it's not, it's not a business exchange. It's not just, you know, teacher and student. It, it really is. It's a very personal relationship and it, it takes a, um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy um, to do that, but um, you know, I, that's the only way I know how to do it. That's great. That's great. Um, we have about ten minutes left, so we'll try to get through most of these questions. We're starting to build up here. Um, one says, uh, "What has been the institutional response to your efforts?" 
Well, you know, it's 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 varied. So at Boston University, I was told that you know this is a waste of time. Um, at uh, at at UCLA, um, the institution has been incredibly supportive. Um, uh, I actually uh, so when I applied to my position at UCLA, uh, I actually I, I was actually not the first choice. Uh, the first choice he has the office right over there. Um, I did not get the job that I applied for at UCLA. Um, but in my interview here, I talked about the diversity project and, um, the chair at the time realized that this was something that was valuable that, um, should be at UCLA. And they were also looking for a new director of peers. And so the the other program I talked I told you about. And so, um, they uh, you know they essentially worked to create a second position to get me here. Um, and you know, does everyone at UCLA value the educational stuff I do as much as the research stuff? Absolutely not. Um, as an institution, is it valued? Absolutely. And um, I, 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 I have been rewarded very well for uh, running these successful programs. And, you know, some of it has been in, in accelerated promotion and advancement. Um, you yeah, know, but others is, you know, when we started peers, uh, when I started with peers, we accepted 60 to 70 students per cohort. Um, but because it was a controlled research study and we could go to the administration and say it's like look at the impact that we're having it's like people keep talking about this achievement gap and we we obliterate it we we invert it um and you know it's it's cheap it's a thousand dollars a student it, it's like it is such a trivial amount of money yeah um and you know so they it used to be all funded on grants it's now all funded by ucla um and you know when they when ucla took over funding they're like okay we're going to fund this but only if you can increase it to up to 200 students a year and we're like yeah done um so we had plenty of students that we that we needed to accommodate and and so mm -hmm. we did so it's it's been a really great experience overall at ucla yeah, that sounds amazing. There's actually another question uh, related to that. It says, it's amazing to see how high a conversion rate you have been able to achieve from undergraduate to graduate education. Do you think this can be brought to the school level so that we can have a similar degree of conversion from high school to undergraduate education? Um, so, yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, I think that um, it does require a, a, a different approach. And uh, I think in many institutions, it is really, it, it's kind of difficult to do um, given the resources that they have. Um, you know, one of the things that really makes a difference in our program. And one of the things that we're trying to test right now um, is that, uh, as you heard the student uh, Eric, Eric Zeracero say in the, in the video, we don't give them projects. We, they have to develop their own projects. Mm -hmm. um, it's scary uh, <laughs> that they all come in really freaked out. It's like, I'm not going to develop a project. I don't know what I'm doing. And we mentor them through the pro the process. Mm -hmm. And in, in doing that sort of discovery-based experiential learning, they they actually discover it's actually not so hard. And that, you know, yeah. science is, is, is actually at its core incredibly simple. Observe the world around you. Hypothesize why you see the things that you see. Create experiments to test your hypothesis, see if, you know, the results support or refute your hypothesis and, you know, repeat, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's just the questions and the methods that are different. And those are details. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in general, um, 
in general, our education system, both at the K through 12 level, as well as the, yeah, particularly in, in STEM education in the, the, at the collegiate level, we focus way too much on details. Um, and uh, at some point that's got to change because all the details I ever need to know are right here and I can look them up. Yeah. So like, why am I memorizing a bunch of details when at the end of the day, I'm just going to pull out this and look it up anyway. Yeah. Um, and what we need to do is be training people how to be both consumers and masters of information. How can we take mm -hmm. that information and use it to answer important questions that, you know, advance our understanding of the world around us. And mm -hmm. You know, uh, for anyone who's ever had to like, you know, memorize valence states or the Krebs cycle or, you know, the the parts of a flower, it's just like, who the hell cares? You know, it's like, why do I need to know this? You yeah. know, it's mm -hmm. like, how about how about teaching people? Here's this repository of information. Here's how you can use that information in a way that will meaningfully impact our society. And yeah. I think that's going to take a wholesale change of the way that we approach education. Um, yeah. See if it happens in my lifetime. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully some sensible minds finally prevail on this. Yeah. It does. It reminds me of when, you know, my math teacher in grade school would say, you're never going to have a calculator in your pocket at all times. And now we look back at that and we're like, you know, it's just funny to think. So yeah, yeah. I do think a, a hey, big theory. What's four times four. <laughs> You know, it's like you don't even have to have it in your pocket. Just yeah. speak loud enough. It's crazy. Yeah. So actually, along those lines, uh, it says here, what advice would you have for potential mentors to students who may not be as inherently tenacious and persistent the way that you've demonstrated? Um, so I, I think. um I think what it's what's important to to focus on is really instilling in students um, the belief that well the understanding that they're in control of their education and that um, you know they need to approach the world like with the growth mindset that you know. Um, you know, my, there are many gifts my, my parents gave me. Um, but you know, one of, one of which was just this constant refrain of like, you can do anything you set your mind to, um, you know, and, you know, I, I, I was not an easy child. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I had my issues. Um, and, you know, I was, you know, I was, I was just always taught that like, you know, regardless of your circumstances, it's just like, you're going to, you're going to be the one that, that defines like how successful or not you're going to be. Yeah. And um, I think really, you know, I just gave this talk to a bunch of my students and peers last night that it's just like, you know, listen, I understand that you know, a lot of you have come from very challenging backgrounds and that you're going to be on this campus surrounded by students who have had every opportunity in the world. And you're going to feel like, you know, that you're in this race and, you know, not only are you behind, but you're behind wearing lead shoes and that how are you ever going to catch up? And it's just like, don't worry about it. Just focus on don't focus on the other people focus on yourself and realize that you know it doesn't matter you know it doesn't matter where you came from what it what matters you know and it, it, it doesn't matter if you fail what matters is how you approach that and you know rather than looking at your challenging circumstances as a deficit it's just like oh i didn't have all these opportunities it's like look at it as you know you didn't have all of these advantages and yet you were still successful enough to get into like one of the most competitive universities in this country and in the world. And that's amazing. And, you know, 
that's not because of your school system. That's not because of people helping you. That's because of you. Mm -hmm. And now you're here. And now you have access to more of those resources. So take that same talent that, that, that got you to UCLA in the first place. Don't think about all the other advantages that other students around you have had. Think about all the advantages that you've had coming from the circumstances that you've come from that makes you hungrier and more tenacious and more resilient and more stubborn and more able to deal with failure than you know people that grew up on a pillow bed with a silver spoon in their mouth yeah. and you know if you if you do that and look at your challenges not as not as uh, a hindrance but you know or a deficit but but an asset yeah um I think really changing that mindset. Um, and and it took me a long time to actually realize that because I, I as a as a student, I kept running into people that I mean all throughout grad school, the people it's just like, how did you know about this? Like, like how is it that you like they have this fellowship that they applied for that I've never even heard of before? And it's like, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. Um, but then I I kind of realized that, you know despite all the challenges, what that gave me was a tool set that a lot of those other folks don't have. Um, and so tap into that. And if we can encourage more students to, to tap into that, I, I think more of them will, will be successful. That's awesome. Yeah, I think this is a great ending point here. I know we're at the top of the half hour. So just want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Uh, but thank you again, Paul, for doing this. This was such an awesome speech. And based on all these questions we've had, you know, I think everyone got uh, something out of it. So for our audience members, our next Cafe Sci will be coming up in October. So be on the lookout for more communications on that. And with that, I'll let everyone get back to having a great Thursday. And I look forward to seeing you all next time. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Perfect. All right. Thank you. See you, everyone.